Signing day is in the books. The 2023 cycle has basically all wrapped up. So how did every Pac-12 school perform? We're going to go into teacher mode today on the show. Let's go. Our Locked On Pac-12, your daily podcast on the Pac-12 Conference. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked On Pac-12. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your number one source to stay up to date with our beloved Conference of Champions. Please continue to like, comment, subscribe wherever you listen to or watch this show, which today is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. And I want to double thank all of you who have subscribed on YouTube. We just hit 2,000 subs on the YouTube channel beyond my wildest dreams. Thank you so much. Let's keep growing the audience and keep everybody engaged here with the conference we hold so dearly. I know my man JT Wistersill does as well. He's the host of Locked On Utes Monday through Friday, wherever you listen to your podcasts on YouTube as well. And uh, JT and I are going to become the teachers that we had once way back in yes. the day. We're handing out report cards, but we're not we're not being so harsh as to go A, B, C, D, E, F. No, 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 no. We're going, we're going way throwback today, JT. There are four grades that a school can get, exceeds expectations, meets expectations, below expectations, or disappointment. One through four. JT, my man, are you ready to rock and roll? And just give a, an overview here of every Pac-12 recruiting class. I'm ready to awaken my inner teacher. We've I've been beat down <laughs> like so many for so long, given <laughs> grades I felt like I was undeserving of. So I am ready to go. JT's ready to, to hand it out. And we're going to go in order here, top to bottom. And this is factoring in the transfer portal. And the rankings, for those of you who don't know, according to 24-7, USC is number one, Oregon number two, Colorado number three, which is just wild. It's like I know it's kind of expected. We'll get to that and such. UCLA number four, Utah number five, Washington number six, ASU seven. They've been a late climber, especially with Jaden Rashada. Arizona eight, Oregon State nine, California ten, more commonly referred to as Cal, as I'm going to teach my subconscious later. Stanford eleven, and Washington State sits at twelve. Let's start with the Trojans, JT. Number one overall class in in the Pac-12 this year, year two for Lincoln Riley. This is a great place for USC to be. I would say meets expectations, which is a good grade, but this is USC we're talking about here. This is what you should expect Mm -hmm. if you're the Trojans. The Trojans, when they're firing at all cylinders, right, should be the top team in the conference. This is a recruiting class that puts them in that position. This is what we expected Lincoln Riley to come in and do. I couldn't agree with you more. I absolutely think they meet expectations. And USC fans got to be fired up because they're already ahead of of expectations just in general of what Lincoln Riley was supposed to be doing in his era with the Trojans. Yeah, I, I think on the recruiting front here, it's meets expectations, but year one exceeds uh, yes. expectations. Yep. I mm-hmm. thought nine to 10 wins would have been great. Puts up 11, that close to the playoff, that close to a Pac-12 title. I mean, that is a, a it, it, it's going yeah. even better than I anticipated it would. But I, I agree with you, meets expectations. Oregon is sitting there at number two. They're turning over a lot of their roster after a 10-win season, which you kind of expect when you've got a coaching staff, even when the previous coach was successful, that being Mario Cristobal. Dan Lanning has you know, been very deliberate and very focused in he wants to bring in his guys. He hasn't said that specifically, yep. but we all know what, what exactly is, is happening here. Oregon is top 10 in the country, number nine on, on 24-7. They're just a shade behind USC. Even though it's a first-time head coach coming off of his first year, and this is his first full cycle, he wasn't handed a rebuild the yeah. way Lincoln Riley was. So I, I would put you know Riley overall as a grade above Lanning. But again, for Oregon, I'm going meets expectations here. 
Yeah, I'm going back and forth on this one too. Part of me wants to say exceeds just because I look at the most four stars of anyone has gotten to, but I mean, one, one five star, that's, that's kind of like what we expect from Oregon top 10 class. They're capable of that. Is, is that what we expect? I mean, they're borderline top 10. So I, I don't know. I'm in a good mood. I'll go exceeds expectations just because like I said, second year too, I just think like firmly being in that top 10 when you're supposed to be kind of flirting with that top 10 right up there, right in there. I think with your, this being his first true recruiting cycle as this is his first year, he's there from start to finish not having to come in, get used to everything, and then dive right into it. For me, having them in there his very first very first full recruiting cycle going into his second year, I'll go exceed the expectations. A little bit higher than than me, perhaps. Yeah, that, that's that's okay. That's 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 okay on uh, in in my view. So uh Colorado here at number three. I, I will be shocked if you don't agree with me that this is exceeds expectations, even for Coach Prime, because when you take over a situation like Colorado, and then even when you have the personality of, of Coach Prime, you figured the recruiting would be better. The talent acquisition would be better. But number three in the Pac-12, I, I don't care who you – I don't care if you brought in Nick Saban. It would, th- this would be exceeds expectations for me. I think this is the easiest one. To, cro- to quote the great Tim Brewster – we coming Colorado definitely <laughs> exceeding expectations for me in the first year. This is just, it feels similar to Lincoln Riley in terms of Lincoln Riley accelerated the timeline of what we thought the rebuild would look like. It's going to take a little bit longer for Colorado in terms of to be competing at the top of the conference to me, but they're going to be up there a lot sooner. I think than people want to say some people over overrating them. Of course it's going to happen with Dion, but I think there's a lot of people kind of underestimating them in terms of their long-term success. I couldn't agree more. This is a phenomenal crap class, especially with those defensive backs. If you can recruit, you can win games, and Mm -hmm. Dion is going to be able to recruit. Ergo, he's probably going to win some games, but it was in such a dire situation that I agree. If if you'd put Dion at, you know, UCLA, for instance, if Chip Kelly had moved on or if they'd moved on from him, that would be a different situation because I think you have a a greater propensity to rebuild at a place like that because you're not starting from as, as low of a spot. But yeah, it exceeds expectations there. UCLA, speaking of the Bruins, coming in at number four. I go exceeds expectations here. They're the number two school in Los Angeles. When you talk about realignment, it's mostly, you know, USC discussion, and then UCLA is kind of an afterthought. They've never been a big recruiting power. They land their highest rated quarterback recruit in program history, I believe, in Dante Moore, who they Mm -hmm. kind of snatched away from Oregon once Kenny Dillingham went to ASU. That's a really big get, especially when you lose Dorian Thompson Robinson. I, I think UCLA exceeds expectations here. I got to agree. Anytime you get a quarterback of that caliber, I think you have to go exceeds too. And look, there's a lot of schools right now. We mentioned Colorado success. We're going to talk about Utah in a moment. All those schools recruiting well and UCLA able to keep pace with them too and continue to do really good things on the recruiting trail. I got to go too. I feel like they're exceeding those expectations. Yeah, I think they're doing well. And Chip Kelly, by the way, not known as a great recruiter. Now, is there tremendous depth in that UCLA class? They don't have a super high volume of players just 28 commits, but, uh, or at least from the, the recruiting ranks, I, I believe that is, um, mm-hmm. I, I, I just wonder if they'll have a bunch of guys who contribute early, but I, I think overall it's a pretty good place to me. But, it, and if Dante Moore hadn't been, been there, it probably would have been meets expectations, but I think they exceed because of, because of that acquisition. That is a big, big thing. And Chip Kelly will have a chance to, to mold him into potentially a really, really good quarterback Uh uh-oh it's the Utes time we're 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 here on the Utes is JT gonna lose his mind is JT gonna freak out is JT excited we're gonna find out what JT thinks about Utah after we find out how excited you should be about FanDuel we're really excited about our new sports betting partner here at Locked On because they're the number one sports book in America if you're new to FanDuel that's even better frankly they have so many great features that make betting on sports fun and Easy. Download FanDuel now so you can bet Super Bowl 57 with a no-sweat first bet between the Chiefs and Eagles. You'll get up to $3,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. So join FanDuel today at FanDuel.com slash locked on to claim your no-sweat first bet on Super Bowl 57. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sportsbook partner of the NFL and our sponsor here at the Locked On Network. All right, the moment you've been waiting for, JT, Utah, fifth in the conference after back-to-back Pac-12 championships. 
They have one of the lower volume classes Mm -hmm. in the 2023 cycle. I know you were telling me before we came on, a lot of Utah fans were disappointed they weren't able to get Walker Lyons, who does have to go on a mission first, but that just means he's going to be physically ready by the time he returns and gets to campus in uh, 2025. And that's a position Utah is starting to become known for with Brant Keithy, yep. who's coming back, Dalton Kincaid. I, I think uh, Yasmin is is the other tight end's name, right, who I think looks like a really solid player. Mm-hmm. I think for the Utes here, you, you're going up against some heavy recruiting hitters, and I don't ever expect Utah to be a power. I think this is just barely meets okay. expectations because when you win the conference two years in a row. Mm -hmm. I think ideally for Utah, if you want to take that next step and become a playoff caliber team at some point in time, which they have been before and just haven't quite, you know, gotten Mm -hmm. there, you got to start recruiting at a very high level. Typically is what we see from programs across the country, unless you're a, a TCU who still does recruit quite well. I think being fifth is is fine for the Utes. I don't think it's a disaster, but when you're the two time reigning champs, I would have said I think to exceed expectations, it's a little more, but it's not bad. I, I think this is just barely meets expectations. To me, when you do something you've never done before, you exceed expectations. And that is what Utah has done with their highest ranked recruiting class in program history. So for me, they have exceeded expectations. I get that you're holding them to a similar standard that I think you would hold all Pac-12 teams to. I'm looking at it in the standpoint of this is something Utah has never done before. The amount of four-star talent they were able to bring in, their highest ever recruiting class once again. Yeah, it would have been nice to get Walker Lyons. I didn't feel like he was ever really going to come. And he always felt like the cherry on top to already a great recruiting class for me. So to me, this this group exceeds expectations because simply put is the highest they've ever brought in in terms of recruiting standpoint 24 7 overall has them at number one for com- or excuse me, not to number one she's 21 for the composite ranking so it's uh, still a really strong recruiting season for the Utes and once again I gotta go exceeds just because they haven't done it before okay okay the JT is captain optimism over here and that's that's okay we that's what that's why we bring them on you know I give the students want- hope by the way you're just yeah, over here you want to crush everyone <laughs> I'm building future leaders of America. I'm trying to toughen them up. Yeah. I'm trying to get them. I'm trying to get them ready. I'm the disciplinarian. I'm the disciplinarian here. Washington is next up at number six. Now, some context on the Huskies recruiting class in the big picture. It doesn't factor into the recruiting ranking, but doesn't it kind of feel, and I and I should have pointed this out for Oregon too that recruiting Michael Penix to come back or Bo Nix at Oregon, that kind of feels like a recruiting victory, doesn't it? I agree. I agree with that for sure. Yeah. So when you put that into the mix, I still say for Washington, this meets expectations. I I think you're closer to exceeds than you are does not meet expectations because you're third in the conference in terms of total amount of blue chip talent. Mm -hmm. You're you're bringing in 11 four-star players. And the most four and five star talent uh, belongs to Oregon in this class from the high school ranks, then USC, then Washington, and then Colorado. So I think if you're the Huskies, who have got some promising defensive back commits uh, as well, which is certainly a position of need for them going forward. They kind of had to reset this year after Kyler Gordon and Trent McDuffie left. Then they had a bunch of injuries as well, and it was kind of Alex Cook trying to hold everything together as as best he could. And their secondary struggled at times. But I think you look at guys like Caleb Presley, like Curly Reed, which is a fantastic name, by the way, especially for a defensive back. It just that just that flows right right off the tongue. As an announcer, I can appreciate that sort of stuff. So I think Washington is doing what they should be doing, what they need to. But I, I think the biggest thing here is they they didn't have a huge glaring need to go into the recruiting ranks to replace all this lost talent because they were able to bring so much of it back. And so that kind of push and pull, I don't think this is even close to Washington's ceiling as a a recruiting program in in the country. I mean, they're, they're 30th overall. I think that's kind of their floor if they're winning consistently with a guy like Kalen DeBoer, but for them it was about bringing players back, which they did. So I'll go meets expectations here. 
I agree. As you mentioned, just getting Penix back, I think is so big and you still bring in a lot of four-star talent. Still a top, like I said, still top 30 class, which when they're hitting on all cylinders, totally agree. They're going to be higher, but still when you're in that top 30 like that, and that's not really factoring in the Michael Penix coming back, who's going to simply put be one of the best quarterbacks in college football next year. Like he already was in 2022. Absolutely agree. I think this meets expectations. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm with you there. Let, let's keep going down the list. Number six, or number seven, rather, Arizona State. They've been a late climber here. They're starting to get mm-hmm. visits for the 2024 class for a caliber of player that just hasn't been making their way to Tempe or considering the Sun Devils at all. Talked about that with Richie Bradshaw of Locked on Sun Devils on yesterday's show, if you want to go check that out. I think this is exceeds expectations because th- this was an Arizona State program that was last in the Pac-12 in recruiting last yep. year. And to climb all the way up to seventh, to land a guy like Jaden Rashad. I mean, Rashada came almost mm-hmm. out of left field. Like that was Absolutely. just even Arizona State people were kind of surprised that they gotten in the mix and ultimately landed him. I go exceeds here for Arizona State. Yeah, as soon as they got Rashad, this had to be exceeds, right? I mean, this is the first first recruiting cycle for Coach Dillingham. I yeah, I mean, what else can you say? They got Rashad, one of the guys at quarterback who should be their guy for the next three years. He's potentially be a three year starter there. I I absolutely agree. I don't see how you could go anything less than exceeds expectations. This is unbelievable. And it's already off to coach Dillingham's era already off to an outstanding start because of not just Rashad, but some of the other talent they've been able to add to, which has a lot yeah. of upside. I, I, I completely agree. Now, most of what we've talked about here has been on the optimistic front, yes. but down here at eighth where the Arizona Wildcats sit, JT, this is the first team that I say does not meet expectations. Now, normally Arizona being eighth wouldn't be that big of a deal. But last year in the off season, highlo- highlighted by Tetero McMillan, who was a major contributor for the Wildcats offense in 2022 and will be again next year, Arizona had a top 25 overall class. Mm-hmm. It was the number 27 transfer class, number 2022 20, composite. And they have taken a step back this year. Mm-hmm. And it, look, it doesn't mean that Arizona can't improve this year, but they've gone from 25th all the way down to 49th. And I think part of that is competition in the Pac-12, but this is not the recruiting bounce back. Doesn't mean you can't have on-field results that are that are encouraging, but this is not the recruiting follow-up, I think, that the Wildcats were maybe looking for. I, I don't think it's you know straight-up disappointment, but I think it does not meet expectations based on what Jed Fish and his staff showed they're capable of. I think every school we've talked about so far in terms of what they did the year before has either climbed or kind of maintained where they were at. Arizona is the first one that really does fall off to your point. So I absolutely agree. I think this does doesn't meet expectations. It is a little bit of a disappointment. So once again, this is the first one we're both kind of negative on because anytime you take such a drastic drop, I think disappointing is the only thing because when you set a standard last year was supposed to be the standard, right? This is supposed to be where they're at again and again and again. And then you take a tumble back. It's kind of like, oh, that. That wasn't expected. So, yeah, disappointing. Another tough one to label here, JT. Oregon State sitting Mm -hmm. at number nine in this 2023 cycle. A little bit behind uh, Arizona, though not by much in the overall 27 sports rankings. Recruiting to Corvallis is hard. Mm-hmm. It's 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 just hard. It's never. I don't think Oregon State will ever win a Pac-12 recruiting battle. Even once you bring in whatever expansion teams are going to be added by by the conference, I really don't think you, you're going to you're going to see Oregon State even ever crack the top three. Not as long as mm-hmm. Dan Lanning's at Oregon and Dion Prime. Dion is at Colorado and. Uh, you know, even Kyle Whittingham is at Utah, Kalen DeBoer at Washington. It, like the deck is just stacked against Oregon State here. I kind of put them in the middle. I, I wanted to put them in the middle, but I will just barely, ju- just barely put them in the meets expectations range because of their most notable recruit slash transfer in the cycle. Exactly. And that's DJ Uyunglele. And And by the way, Oregon State's overall ranking has improved from last year to this year, which you would expect from a recruiting standpoint after a 10-win season. So I think the Beavs, I I think that is a lower end of the meets expectations because you maybe would have liked to see them stay above an Arizona or Arizona State. But I do think overall they're doing fine, and that's meets expectations. And then DJ is kind of the cherry on top. 
For you, did you think they had a chance at DJ going into kind of the transfer cycle? No, I thought it was more optimistic, wishful thinking. And I exactly thought the same thing, which is why for me, they exceeded expectations because I did not think they were going to be able to land a quarterback of that caliber. I am so tired of all the DJ Uyunglele. Hey, I've talked about this a few times. I think it is so over-exaggerated. Yes, I know it wasn't great at Clemson. He's not a, amongst the best quarterbacks in college football amongst that top four group, which is the level he was expected to pay at, at Clemson, right? Deshaun Watson, Trevor Lawrence, the guys who have came through there. He wasn't up to that level, but he was still really good and helped them win ACC championships. So to me, getting a guy like that who still has so much upside, he was a five-star out of high school. I think people forget that quickly and just had some struggles and ups and downs at Clemson. But that program in general, coordinators are coming out in a little bit. I, they're not the same group they were when they had those top quarterbacks either. And we saw how much Trevor and Deshaun had to put on their backs too. And DJ wasn't able to carry all that weight. But I think at a place like Oregon State, he's going to have a ton of success. So to me, yes, you do fine job recruiting. That's where kind of the mean expectations right in there. Maybe the disappointing to your point. But DJ to me is like the frosting on the cake. I mean, he is almost everything there. I think that alone for me puts them in exceeds expectations because I think he's going to be a fantastic addition for the beefs. I, I think he certainly could be. And it's certain it, it's definitely the most notable transfer. Mm-hmm. There's some other ones too. Don't sleep on Jermaine Terry, the tight end coming from Cal who, who grades as a four-star transfer and, Was that coming out of high school when he committed to play for the Bears? Oregon State's had a lot of success with tight ends under Jonathan Jonathan Smith. Mason Tufaga, a guy you've probably covered at one point in time, coming over from uh, Utah, maybe a a potential replacement for for Omar Spates, who went down to uh, LSU. But if you need to replace your unhealthy snacks with healthy ones that still taste delicious, then Built Bar is indeed the way to go. What makes Built Bar so good? Well, for starters, they're covered in 100% real chocolate. That's right. Real chocolate. And yes, we've got more teams to cover. Fear not, Pac-12 fans. I'm not really sure how Built does it, but the bars taste a lot like a candy bar. I've got them in my pantry. I've got them in my golf bag at all times. 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, a whopping 17 grams of protein to keep you going whatever you're doing. Hiking, golfing, working out, snacking late at night, whatever it is. It can fill you up. You can order yours at built.com. You can also get them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club. So go check out the latest flavors that they've got, whichever one tickles your fancy. They have a bunch of amazing ones. My personal favorite, mint brownie. I don't know about you, JT, if you have a flavor that you like in particular, but I'm a mint brownie kind of guy. I think churro for me. I've always been a big churro Mm. guy. Can't go wrong. Can't go wrong with churro or any of the other great flavors. Go check out Built Bars today. All right, continuing down uh, the list here with the final three that are, it's it's tough. It, it is it is tough sometimes, but these are all places that are not super surprising to see at the bottom three of the conference. So behind Oregon State, you've got Cal at at number ten, who have added a couple decent transfers. Right, I like the running back. The, the, the moves they made in the running back room mm-hmm. to supplement Jaden Ott. They got Byron Cardwell from Oregon, who's solid. And then the the guy whose name I'm about to look up from uh from Tennessee that that's coming over. Yeah, Justin Justin Williams. Yeah, Ju- Justin yeah. Williams Thomas. I think he he's got a solid amount of potential. I think that adding Sam Jackson is intriguing at the quarterback position. But Cal down here at number ten, off of a four and eight season. You're in Berkeley. It's not a recruiting power. You've got some solid names in your backyard in the Bay Area for sure, but Cal is not a high priority for a lot of recruits there. They were kind of in the mix for Jaden Rashada. I, I think this this kind of meets expectations. Not an excited meets expectations, but off of a four and eight, if I told you four and eight, I mean, frankly, I think this could be closer to exceeds than meets expectations for Cal. A four and eight season should result in them being almost last and they're two spots above last, at least. Mm hmm. So yeah, I'm I'm with you. I mean, it's it's kind of like the student you didn't expect a lot from. I feel like, and it's like, well, you ended up like a little bit ahead than the kids at the very bottom. So it's like, yeah, it's still a little optimistic. And I'm not trying to dump on Cal fans here. I'm just saying, anytime you're in the bottom three, it's not exactly ideal. But this is coming off four and eight to your point. Like you're not the very last. So there's there's that encouraging progress at least. So I think meets expectations is is very fair with a chance depending on how well those transfers pay out to exceed expectations. Yeah. Come the conclusion of the 2023 season when we look back. On and see how all these age. Yeah, I think for Stanford, who's sitting at number 11 right now, 
I'm not going to give them a grade. And here's why. They're the kid who transferred in with wild circumstances in the middle of the school year and who is doing the work, but is not actually going to get graded on that work because it's just not a fair thing to ask yeah. him to step in and have the grasp on the concepts that the other students in the class do. Stanford is now a much harder place to recruit. You can't add transfers. You can't, like I, I don't have that high of expectations right now. I, I mean, they didn't add a bunch of players, but a new coach coming in. Stanford can recruit at a high level, yes. by the way. They, they've had top 20 classes in the country. So in that sense, maybe I would lean towards does not meet expectations. But I just think in this new era of college football with NIL and the portal, it's really, really tough for Stanford at, at this point in time until they can start winning some games. I, I don't know. What, what do you think? This is not a reflection at all on the coaching staff. As you mentioned, they were able to no. a very difficult hand, but to me, they did not meet expectations for the simple fact of they went into the season with high profile recruits. Hunter Clegg was a four star. Walker Lyons was a four star. David Shaw left. Those guys departed to me. The loss of those players makes us a disappointment just in terms of, I, I actually like your idea, not really putting a grade on it, but just for the sake of doing it, I am still going to put one on, but just because you lose those high profile guys to me, it is a disappointment just in terms of where you used to be in the rankings to where you are now, but definitely not one of those ones where I'm like, Oh, this is such a disappointment and all these things, because there are a lot right. of circumstances that led to the position they're currently in. But because you lose that much talent to me, that much high profile talent too got to be a little bit of a disappointment if we have to put a grade on it. Let's round it out with Washington State, the only team that to me gets the D rating mm. of disappointment here because you're coming off a seven-win season. There's been a lot of optimism, and they, they were a nine-win capable team this last year. They just weren't able to convert some of those on-field results the way you would have liked them to, perhaps, if you're a Cougars fan, blowing the Oregon game, not being able to pull out uh, a couple others. The Utah game at home, for instance, when Bryson Barnes was playing, I think those are the two most glaring instances of, boy, those are games that we really, really could have or should have had, and it translates into being last. And when you have, you know, Cal off a four and eight season, Stanford off a three and nine with a coaching change. There's no excuse on the recruiting front, even losing coordinators, which is, you know, certainly part of this equation. I, I can't look at this from the outside and say anything other than, yeah, that, that's that's disappointing for Washington State to have what they view in Pullman and they should as a successful season, not amazing season, but a successful one to then be at the bottom in talent acquisition. That That is there's no reason the Bay Area school should be above Wazoo. This is the one where we're coming in after class. We got to talk a little bit more and figure out exactly yeah. what's going on here, what we need to <laughs> what we need to sort out. Because as you mentioned, I mean, not a not a single four star. Look, it's hard to get four star talent sometimes. Used to Utah used to struggle with that all the time, but I'd like to at least see one in that regard. And as you mentioned, just a really disappointing step back. Yeah. I mean, for the twenty four seven composite rankings I have pulled up, there. I mean, they're towards the back of everything when you look at seventieth overall, sixty four for the composite. And the 24 one I got. And, and you make you make a good point, by the way. They're the only program in the conference that doesn't have a four star recruit coming yeah. in. Even Arizona State has got two. And mm -hmm. I think ASU's got more recruiting advantages, but they're off of a complete yeah. and utter rebuild. Mm -hmm. 1000 percent so yeah it's i think the it's the only thing you can say is they didn't meet expectations and i just actually not even did meet expectations i agree with you it's just a flat out disappointment so yeah disappointing at the position right now for washington state but i really trust the program they're building there and i think they'll still get the most out of these guys and still be competitive but in terms of just ranking the recruiting class and it's like oh what's the ceiling for this group this is by far the least high of all yeah, the school that, that, yeah th this this is this is the basement this is not the floor this is the basement yeah. for them recruiting because i i do like dickert as a coach and it's it, washington state is not the easiest place to be oh. a coach not 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 trying to make any bones about that but i think that you can set the standard a little a little bit higher than that so teacher spencer and teacher jt are uh done there for the day handing out our recruiting grades jt wistersill of locked on utes appreciate it as always my man and uh won't be the last time we hear from you great coming on spence appreciate it appreciate everyone listening i will see you next time have a great weekend and i hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day